If you want to see how we change this closet from this to this, well, if you want to learn how to do it, keep on watching. Let's start it. This is our home hallway closet, and as you can see, there is a copious amount of different types of items in there, all beautifully disguised behind this curtain. Yeah, I know, very tacky, but that's why we're moving all of this and completely redoing it with a complete makeover. The first step, of course, is to clear out all the items, whether it's a vacuum, books, medicine, and apparently a copious amount of vase. Yeah, I don't know why we have so many. How many? Glass vases does or vases do you need? Hmm? Really? In life? How many? I don't know. We have a lot. I don't know where when we're gonna use them, but I'm sure they'll come in handy soon enough. Hopefully one of those ones doesn't break. We have to find another one. Yes, I know, I kid, I kid. But after we have this entire thing gutted, which did not take very long, it's time to remove any of the other pesky items in this closet. So we have a completely blank canvas. I removed the shelf supports and all the base. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is to make sure you score the top of the base first, especially if that base is caulked, and then start removing the base. Otherwise, you might be ripping off some drywall with it. When I first purchased this home, this was just an ugly slider, and apparently I just replaced it with an ugly curtain. But it's now finally time to remove the trim and get it fully drywalled out. But before we do that, I want to do some type of back installation that will not only provide a decorative character to the space, but also structural support for our shelves. And that's where these 2x2 two two wood slats come into play. I'm actually measuring and cutting them of the exact length needed to span the length of the back wall of the closet. In this case, each piece was approximately 58 and a half inches long. And once I had all my pieces cut, I then took them over to my table saw and cut every single one right in half. This basically gives us the ability to get the same exact look that we wanted in the first place, but also being budget conscious because we're only having to use half the amount that I originally anticipated. This step really didn't take very long to do, just be mindful of making sure you have a proper push stick and a table saw feather board to make life easier on you. Now that we have all of our paneling cut, we can proceed to start installing. The first step is to make sure you can guarantee exactly where your stud placements are, which can be easily found with a stud finder. I do this at the very bottom of the wall as well as about six feet up, and then use some type of straight edge and a sharpie to guarantee that we can hit studs all the way up. In order to give these slots some added structural support, I am applying some silicone to the back side and then nailing it with 16 gauge nails. Now you obviously don't have to use silicone, you can use construction adhesive, but I find silicone provides an extremely strong hold, but yet it doesn't damage the existing wall if this paneling was ever removed in the long run. As for spacing, I'm actually just using another slat to provide equal spacing all the way up the wall, which did make the spacing process extremely easy, but you can always go more or less as to your liking. But keep in mind, this specific spacing is actually providing some structural support for our shelves, which we'll get to momentarily. As I work my way up from the very bottom, I still do have a level with me just to guarantee that we have proper alignment all the way across each slat. Once I like the positioning, I then nail both sides off and then the dead center to guarantee that we have alignment all the way across the slat. I replicate this process over and over and over again, but it really didn't take very long to do because the process and the materials were all the same and very straightforward. And as a general side note, if you do decide to use a silicone, make sure you're using one that can actually be paintable. In theory, you don't actually see any of the silicone on this project, but you never know what's gonna ooze out once it's applied to the wall. Now that we're done with our slats, we can move on to repairing our drywall. Now I didn't have to remove the trim, I could have just installed some sliding doors again, but I wanted a very open, accessible space, and that's why I wanna actually finish this off and potentially install some type of barn door or folding barn door system. At the end of this video, let me know what you think if I should actually put some type of door on this space or keep it the way it is. Once I have my drywall panels cut, I then install with proper drywall screws, and once fully secured, we can move on to mudding. 
If you haven't done a lot of drywall repair before, don't be intimidated. Many people can do it. It just depends on how quickly you can get it done. The real drywall guys are masters at their craft and can do this in mere moments and can seemingly have a perfect finish without even sanding. That's not me because I'm not a professional drywaller, but I do know the process. In order to cover up these unsightly edges properly, I first mud both sides and then stick metal corner edging on both sides. This stuff is actually very nice to work with because one, it gives you a perfect edge all the way down, but two, there's actually drywall tape attached to both sides, so it sticks very well to this drywall mud as long as you press it in a bit first and then you can go back over it with excess drywall mud. As you saw earlier, I'm utilizing pre-mixed mud, but before I actually apply it to the wall, I am adding a bit of water to the mix, not a lot, just a slight amount to make sure to smooth out the viscosity, and that makes the application process much more seamless in my opinion. And just remember, this wall does not have to be perfect the very first time. You can apply the product, sand it down, and apply a second coat of mud just in case to have a perfect smooth finish all the way across. As a general side note, this material does not dry quickly. I actually have to put a space heater in this area overnight just to make sure that it's fully dried before the next day. But once I do come back to it the next day, it's ready to start sanding. And I know a lot of people don't actually use a random orbital sander for this type of application, but I find it's actually a really nice, easy way to go about it, as long as you're able to connect your sander to your shop vac, which will suck up the majority of the dust. Even though the vast majority of the sanding is taken care of with the random orbital, I do still use some type of sanding pad to do some fine tune edge work. And as you can see with this sanding pad, there's actually LED lights built into it, which makes it extremely easy to see any edges that might not be perfectly smooth yet until I get to them. Once I have all edges completely sanded down and looking smooth, I can move on to seal coating. Yep drywall still needs to be seal coated, even if it's blank. This sealer is specifically designed for drywall and we're applying it using the Wagner Paint Stick Easy Roller. This device makes painting any surface extremely easy and quick because all you have to do is actually suck up the paint product into the wand and with the handle you pump the paint into the roller or in this case sealer into the roller which makes it extremely quick and efficient to apply any type of paint or sealer. Plus, because I control the amount of product that's actually going to the roller itself, I greatly reduce the amount of drips that I would normally have if I was using just a standard roller. As we wait for the sealer to dry, we can get our texture gun ready to go. If you haven't used one of these before, I assure you it's actually extremely simple and easy to use. First step is to make sure you have the proper product to use for a standard textured wall. And depending on the type of texture that you're going for, there are a few different variables that you have to account for. But in this circumstance, we are going for a orange peel finish, which is a very standard finish in most residential homes. In order to have the proper texture, you need the proper consistency within your product. And for orange peel, it calls out for something that looks more like pancake batter, and that's when we know it's ready to start spraying. I pour the product directly into our hopper, connect our sprayer to our air compressor, and we're ready to start spraying. You can always do a few test runs in a couple different areas, and you're easily able to wipe off any excess if need be, but from here, it's fairly straightforward. I do suggest trying to go in more of a swirl pattern to have more of a random consistency within your texture, but once we have it applied, all you have to do is let it dry, and as we wait for it to dry, let's make some shelves. Our shelves could be made up of a number of different types of materials, but I do want to have some really heavy duty beefy shelves for the fact that we have very long spans in this closet. That's why I'm going with 2x10 Douglas fir material. This lumber that I purchased comes in multiple lengths, but I purchased 10 foot lengths because I can cut them in half, which equals 60 inches, and because we have a closet width that is 58 and a half inches, we have very minimal waste. I want nice square edges on both sides of each lumber, which is why I run each piece of lumber through my table saw on both sides, one because of glue up and two because of style aesthetic. 
After I have both sides cut for each shelf, I can move on to gluing. I apply a liberal amount of glue on one side of each board, make sure it's spread appropriately across the entire span, and grab a few clamps. The clamps I'm using on this project are pipe clamps, and those are my favorite clamps to use for large glue up projects like this. And as a general side note, if you are interested in purchasing any of these tools or materials seen in this video, I'll make sure to have a link in the description box below. I make a total of five shelves exactly the same as this, and as we wait for those to dry, let's get to painting. There are quite a few crevices and corners within this slat wall, which is why I suggest spraying versus just hand painting. We're using a Wagner Flexio sprayer, and as you can see, we're going with a very bold, rich green color. I thin out the paint slightly, mix it up so we have a nice consistency within it, and away we go. I didn't mask off the surrounding hallway just to make sure that we didn't have any overspray, but that's a very small amount of time expenditure when you consider how much time we saved by spraying this paint versus trying to apply it by hand. There are obviously deep grooves on the bottom and top of each slat, which is why I not only have to spray straight on, but actually at an upward angle and downward angle on every single slat location. Because I'm doing three passes, you want to make sure you're not applying too much paint, which is perfect for this sprayer because you're able to completely adjust the amount of spray that's coming through the nozzle. At this point in time, I wanted to say a huge and special thank you to the sponsor of this week's video, Wagner. They provided all the Wagner tools seen in this video, and they really did come in handy on a project like this. This sprayer is part of the Wagner Flexio series, and they have multiple sprayers to choose from, whether it's for a small project like this or painting an entire house. Wagner has been an amazing sponsor of the BYOT channel for a couple years now, and I truly appreciate all the love and support that they provided over that period. If you want to check out their amazing lineup to choose from, whether it's the sprayers, the surface prep tools, the heat guns, the tents, and so forth, then please check out the link in the description box below. After I finished applying our forest green to the closet, I then moved on to the exterior paint of our hallway area, just trying to dress it up in a nice neutral color because the stark green is gonna be more of the unique contrast in this entire space. There are much fewer corners and cavities in this area comparatively to our slat wall, which is why a roller is plenty fine in this type of application. As we wait for our paint to dry, we can move on to some sanding. Yep, I know, everyone's favorite part. But in order for me to make this sanding process go extremely fast, I actually take my rotary sander by DeWalt and smooth down any of the potential ridges between the two slabs. I'm using 120 grit sandpaper with my first pass, and I could go into a lower grit, but in order to avoid swirl marks, I highly suggest going with a 120 or at least a 100 grit sandpaper. And if you're asking yourself why not hook up your sander to a shop vac, well, it went kaput on me and that's why I'm a little extra sandy on this project compared to most projects. After I did my first pass with my rotary sander, I then moved on to my random orbital sander using 120 grit sandpaper. This will just really smooth out those areas and make sure that any swirl marks that were created were completely eliminated with this pass. In order to finish off the front edge nicely, I did take a sanding block with 200 grit sandpaper just to smooth down that front and bottom edge. Once the dust settled a bit, I then took some mineral spirits just to wipe off the vast majority of all the excess sawdust on these boards. And this is always a really nice satisfying moment because I do get a chance to see what the final look is going to be before we get to finishing. But before we get to finishing, we need to do one final cut of these slabs. And that's actually dictating the actual length, as well as making sure that we have proper alignment within the space. Shockingly, our 1950s closet walls are not perfectly 90 degrees, which my contractor square made extremely apparent once I put it up right against the wall. But luckily for us, by applying our contractor square and actually just nudging out that measurement slightly, which is about an eighth of an inch, that completely accounts for the misalignment within our wall perfectly, and that way our shelf will fit snugly. Now that our shelf is cut to the proper length, the only thing you have to do is install. Now you don't have to do this next step, but I always find measuring and applying a couple pocket holes exactly where our stud placements are will actually set you up for success when trying to nudge heavy large shelves in place by yourself. 
I clamp down our Craig pocket hole jig right where our stud placement is, then drill our hole so we have a perfect pocket hole for our fasteners. With that finally taken care of, we can move on to the installation portion of these shelves. Now, as you can see, this is quite a tight fitting shelf, but that's exactly what I wanted to have a nice flush fit within the closet space. Once I get the shelf to the proper height that I want it, I then give it a few love taps with a mallet and double check for levelness. And as long as the shelf is level, I can then secure it in place with fasteners on both sides. Now remember, it's going in between the grooves and this is why I really love this style because not only does this wall have character with the slat system, but it also provides extremely durable hold because there's zero wiggle room between those two slats where the shelf is being held. These three large shelves have the same length as well as depth, but, but if you decide to do any vertical sections like we did on this project, you do need to make sure you cut the back side so the front edge of our vertical panel is also lining up flush against the front edge of our horizontal panels. Once I rip approximately three quarters of an inch off the back side, I then cut our panel to the proper height and install as needed. In your application process, you certainly don't have to use a vertical shelf, but I did want a space specifically for our vacuum and a couple other taller items, as well as utilizing the space to the left of our vacuum with shelving to match the shelving above. And the beautiful thing about the slat wall, if you ever want to adjust the height of any of these in the future, you always can by moving it to another rung. For the finishing portion, we are using General Finishes Enduro VAR 2 Satin Finish. This is a really nice finish to work with because it's a water-based urethane finish, which basically means that you get the durability of a water base, but the beauty of an oil because it has a built-in ambering finish tint to it. And yes, I know what you're gonna be asking yourself, Brent, why didn't you just apply the finish before you installed the shelves? Well, to be quite open and honest with everyone, I have a three week old baby and I'm not getting a lot of sleep. So that tends to affect judgment in some circumstances, but hopefully on your project, you realize that you want to apply the finish first before you install the shelves. Note to self, but with that application taken care of, we are done. absolutely love how this closet turned out. It's incredible space now. What it was before to what it is now is truly remarkable. It's a very functional space now, and I'm just wondering, do I even need doors on the space now that I know how good this area looks? I don't know. You let me know because this really does look like one beautiful, sexy beast of a closet makeover with plenty of vase space now. Yeah, for all of our vases.